we have to actually do some thinking about why we think prisons are necessary and who we think is inside because a lot of it is is kind of just this idea of just removing ourselves from that idea and you know folks being thrown away and we don't even um, show up for them um, or think about it and somehow elevate ourselves to a different place because we are not them. Hello, and welcome to Arts Across America. My name is Jasmine Manns, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Reynolds, and we're excited to speak with some more Pentu Hughes. And today's topic is music and prison abolition. Arts Across America continues this spring with a focus on cultural leadership and public healing. Topics include art for healing, decolonization, and art as a catalyst for change. We'll explore artistic contributions from the Black trans theater community, learn about sacrifice zones in the environment, fight for women's rights in the Latinx community, discuss the prison and detention center system, and hear about the importance of indigenous food and health, plus much more. We will witness performances and conversations as we join together in healing our community, our country, and ourselves. I would like to welcome Jason Reynolds, Washington, D.C. native. Jason Reynolds is a New York Times bestseller, author of novels and poetry books for youth and adults, including track series, Ghosts, All American Boys, Mal and Morales, Spider-Man, For Everyone, Long Way Down, which received both the Newberry and Prince Honor. Welcome, Jason. I appreciate you. Thank you, Jason. Always good to see you. Um, I course, would like to welcome my co-host Jasmine Manns. Jasmine is a Black American poet and performance artist from Newark, New Jersey. Her poetry collection, Black Girl Call Home, which was published by Penguin Random House, uh, has been named a must-read by Time Magazine. Oprah Magazine, shout out to the O, Bolcha, Essence, Marie Claire, just to name a few. Jasmine can also be heard as the voice of Alta Beauty's Muse campaign, honoring Black beauty and recently filmed the short for nowness and Pangaea in celebration of Black queerness. We acknowledge that we are standing on the traditional land of the Nacotchtank Piscataway people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have been the stewards of this land throughout the generations. The brilliant Samora Pender Hughes is a composer, pianist, vocalist known for striking intimacy with carefully crafted, radically honest lyrics and high-level musicianship. He's also known for his use of music to examine socio-political issues and fight for change. Tamora is the first ever Art for Justice Soros Justice Fellow and a recipient of Chamber Music America's 2020 Visionary Award. He has been designated as a Creative Capital Awardee, a Joe's Pub and Public Theater, NYC Artist in Residence, and a Sundance Composer Lab Fellow. He's a graduate of the Juilliard School and is currently getting his PhD at Harvard University, which basically means Samora is a brilliant person. He became serious about making music his life after living in Cuba, studying spiritual musical traditions. After moving to New York City to study at Juilliard under master teachers Kenny Barron and Kendall Briggs, he met his artistic mentor and MacArthur winning playwright, the great legend, Anna DeVere Smith. This meeting started him down the path of writing lyrics and combining film and theater with his music in radical new ways. And with the help of his mentors, Tamora eventually crafted his unique style of lush, immersive music with maximalist visual storytelling and high levels of concept. Tamora is currently pursuing his PhD in creative practice and critical inquiry. How about that? Under mentor VJ Iyer at Harvard University. Let's go ahead and get to it. I mean, the images behind you, uh, some of the most radical, that's a, that word is always weird for me, but it's like a, 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 quote unquote radical, um, the revolutionaries of our time, polarizing figures, some might say. Um, um, and so can you talk a bit about those pieces, where you got them, who made them, what they mean to you? Um, that, that would be dope. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. And just first want to say honored to be here with you, Jason and Jasmine. You know, just just love, love you both as artists and as people. 
Um, so I'm honored to be here. So these pieces behind me um, were created by an uh, artist named Pit Panther. Um, and you can, you know, find his stuff um, um, on all the different, you know, uh, social sites. He is a good friend of mine and he is currently incarcerated. Um, and I actually met him um, in within the last year and, you know, we've become good friends. And he's just one of the most brilliant artists I know. And um, he actually sends me these pieces as um, kind of like part of our greetings to each other and as thank yous in certain ways or like basically, you know, when we'll exchange things or exchange ideas, he sends um, these pieces. Um, and so there's so many reasons why they're important to me. One is that I love the idea of art being of use that way. You know, so many times it's like very um, esoteric, but for him, the art itself is a statement in the sense of he not only, um, you know, makes the pieces of these uh, figures, but he also puts quotes, which are on the back, um, representing, you know, from each person, which represents um, the political philosophies that we share. Um, we are, uh, he, he's a member of the Revolutionary Intercommunal Black Panther Party. So this is not like a game for, for, for either of us. Um, we, you know, um, we are, are both in the process of um, connecting both with each other and as community, trying to actually not only, um, you know, be present in the legacy, but also to act actively work um, in terms of dismantling prisons and police um, dismantling ice, things like all those things, and uh, imagining new systems, new new ways of being, ways of relating and caring for one another in their place. Um, it's also important to me because this is one of the most brilliant individuals I know, um, and one of the most brilliant artists, and he is currently incarcerated. And as y'all probably know, some of our most brilliant artists in, in this country and in this world are currently incarcerated. And why that's important for me is that we have a, a, in this country a very specific vision or idea of who is it is the type of person that is incarcerated. And um, it's literally the exact opposite of that. <laughs> um, you know, the most brilliant folks that I know are, incar are incarcerated. The most caring people I know are incarcerated. The most... Um, the people that work the hardest in the world, that get up every morning and just like work for other people every day are incarcerated. Um, and so I think that if we are going to dismantle um, and kind of get rid of our, our need and our time to like, oh, prisons are just a part of our life, whatever, um, we have to actually do some thinking about why we think prisons are necessary and who we think is inside because a lot of it is is kind of just this idea of just removing ourselves from that idea and you know folks being thrown away and we don't even um, show up for them um, or think about it and somehow elevate ourselves to a different place because we are not them. Um, so I think that's part of why it's important for me as far as who these individuals are. Um, he actually, Pitt was the one who chose, you know, the individuals to to send to me, but they are all individuals that I really connect with. Um, as you mentioned, I did spend some time in Cuba as a, as a child, and that was very formative for me artistically. Um, I practiced Santeria and I played the bata drums when I was there. And so for me, it's like deep in my in my soul. But also being there provided a vision of another world, um, something something else, um, you know, and I think that's part of why I'm, I feel so privileged and grateful to travel and be in different places is that something about about being in one place is that in a certain way because it's all you experience you think it's the only thing that it's the only way things can be you know and so it was really formative for me to be somewhere else and um and somewhere like cuba where so many other things are possible and ways of being are possible um and uh yeah I, the only other thing i would say about these figures is all folks speaking truth to power and also thinking very specifically about um, not only the ideas of how to get us free, but like practically, meaningfully what we need to do to get there, struggling with that question of what do we need to do to get there and not stopping at the things that are safe or easy, but actually thinking about, okay, we can't get there if this system exists, not reform, not whatever. If the system exists, we can't get there. And so how do we, you know, dismantle that and build something new? I think it's beautiful that you're using words like dismantle and abolition. Um, 
But why do you think like those words are so triggering in today's society? Why do you think that we are so fearful of the word abolition and words in terminology like uh, dismantle the police and, and reform? Why, why, why are we so triggered as a society? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. And I think there's a lot of different reasons. One like fundamental psychological reason that I don't think we talk about enough is that I think we are all terribly afraid of real, like life changing change, like earth shaking change. Like what is that gonna do to our everyday ways of being? Yeah, you know, and and the reality is, yes, it is gonna take, it's gonna be real different if we build the world, you know, I think I think people want to hold on the same plane, like, you know, the things that we, uh, the violences that we see and that we claim to want to like get rid of, you know, um, can can be gone while also like our lives don't have to really change that much, you know. And I think that that's why this middle space is very great for people where they're like, yeah, maybe we can get there through reforms or through like, you know changing this little thing or like training people better. It's like, because that means that they don't really have to materially like do anything differently. And I think that there are a lot of things we have to do really differently. Um, and, and I also think it's it's something about, uh, there's something about the, my, my friend, the, po the poet T Tango Ice and Martin, he says, he has this phrase in one of his poems, it says, get the Romans out your mind, you know? And I always love that because I'm like, that's another issue of it is we've been so trained into, these are the systems that have existed forever and they always have to exist. And society will, like, we will all, I don't know, I don't know what people actually think will happen if, they're, if, if, if prisons don't exist, you know? But whatever they think is gonna happen, it's like, the apocalypse or something. And, you know, for a lot of us, I think there's a lot of, there's different elements to that, which is number one, for some of us, that place that they're afraid of is already here, you know? And so that's one thing, you know, it's like, if your brother's on death row and experiencing what that means every day, it's already that world for him, you know? Or, or someone, you know, you have a relative that's been murdered by the police, you know, or kept in a cage for, you know, an ICE detention center. So, for some folks, they're like, well, why are you afraid of that? Like, that's already here for some of us. The other, and then the other thing is just that I think it's just because folks are not um, maybe like armed with the the knowledge of what is possible that is otherwise, you know, as Sean Crowley said, the otherwise possibilities. Like, I just love that idea because it's like, there's so many other things that are possible as to how we can um, deal with each other as to how we can solve the problems of violence, of, you know, um, all the things that contribute to the things that we think we need prisons and police for, you know, or not to mention ICE, like borders. I mean, like, there's the, all these concepts in our mind as to what these things are for and that those are the only ways to deal with these perceived ideas. And that's just the, the first layer. Then obviously we, we have to deal with, like, the white supremacy, the capitalism, the uh, the entrenched systems that you know people buy into. These are conversations that a lot of our generation is sort of having, um, trying to have, and I think it's important that we continue to have them and complicate them, right? Like that's you know, in order for us to continue to sort of carve that out, we have to continue to complicate them. And so I want to ask, and right now I'm sure there are going to be people watching or people watching who are like, but what, but what about, but what about, but what about, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pose a but what about. Right. I'm going to I'm going to pull because I think it's healthy for us to make sure that we're not afraid to to challenge each other. Right. Yeah. So like when I remember Angela Davis, you know, who is a hero to anyone who thinks like this. Right. All of us. Right. Who are, I mean, it's hard to. Oh, yeah. And she she yeah, she yeah, that's your hometown. She your yeah. hometown. <laughs> I just realized it just dawned on me. Yeah. 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 But some more is hey, everybody. He lives in New York, but he's, he's a big dude. And oh, uh, man, the man. great the great Angela Davis. Um, has been there for most of her life in, in the Bay and in LA and in, 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 the area, in the California in general. I remember when, I'm pretty sure this was around, and I don't want to misquote, so forgive me if I'm wrong, if Angela Davis happens to be watching this. Um, I, re I think it was around Dylan Roof. Hmm. And Angela, and after Dylan Roof killed all those, those black folks in that church, Angela Davis said, 
I know you all won't understand or you'll disagree, but when I say that no one should go to prison, I mean even Dylan Roof, right? I mean that I mean that even Dylan Roof. It can't just be black folks don't go to prison or, or brown folks don't go to prison. Even Dylan Roof, who has murdered all these people in cold blood, even him. If I'm against it, I'm against it for everybody, right? What do you say to people who have a hard time grappling with with that? Because it is a comp. Yes. That is that is a different way of thinking. But we think about like all of our benevolent brothers and sisters, or even our folks who've made a mistake, or our folks who got jammed up by poverty, or our folks who right like yeah. they don't belong there. We should figure out other ways. But what do you say to a vigilante who mows down innocent mm -hmm. black folk because of racism? Yeah, yeah. So I guess um, that's that's a very important question, and I'm really glad that you raised it. And I, my first um, thought as a, as a, you know, an addition to that question or answer to that question is, I always think, do you want vengeance or do you want this to stop happening over and over again? That's my question, right? Because I think that people, I mean, I think people want both, you know, to, if we're being real and we don't talk about that either, that's complicated. I think that punishment and vengeance is is a, something that we all feel, you know, in different contexts, which we never talk about, you know, maybe in Shakespeare or something like that, we talk about it, but it's like, you know, uh, we don't really talk about when we feel like something is done to us and, you know, what does that mean? What does that make us feel or, or to people we care about? Um, and, and so I respect that feeling. I don't think that that's not a feeling. I think we should act out. I don't think that that's healing or that that's like healthy for, for, uh, anybody, but I understand it. But I also think we confuse that or we say that that's the same thing as believing that punishing that one person will mean that there aren't, that that violence, number one, will somehow be rectified through that act of, of punishing them in that way. And also that, that it ever means that it won't happen again, which clearly based on our history and how we see things keep happening, is not gonna, that's not what's going to stop it from happening. You know, what's going to stop it from happening is a lot of things at the same time. But, you know, some of those things one uh, have to do with, um, some of those things have to do with the fact that the very reasons that he does all the type of things that he does is baked into the very foundations of our country, which obviously many people are, have, have talked about before me and can talk about much more eloquently than I. But, that I think what's even more important than that is that it's not only that it's baked into the foundations, it's that as we continue to pretend that it's not, we continue to, in a certain way as a country, make room for and justify the ideas and the, and the histories behind which he comes into, into being as that person doing those things. And so for me, a big part of it is like, there's so many things that we have to grasp at the root of and we have to go from there, right? And it's not just white supremacy. It is white supremacy. But it's also, like, misogyny. It's also, like, you know, it's a lot of dudes, you know, doing this. It's all men. So, you know, we really got to work on that. Like, that's a conversation we really don't talk about. We really don't talk about, like, men and violence, you know, men and, you know, all these different things. Um and so that's something that's going to have to transform if we're going to have folks stopping to do that. And, and so, yes, we really need to have some serious conversations, particularly, I think, men among like men with men, like challenging each other about deconstructing like these violences that we're taught and like where they come from and what's really happening on a, emotional, physical, mental levels. Like we never talk about that. So that's a lot that's going on. We're also going to have to figure out um how to build a space and imagine a society where we model um caring for others in the most deepest of ways and the most complex of ways over cultures of violence and vengeance because i think that we also like disassociate ourselves from these ind individual folks or whatever is happening and we say it's like okay you know 
we see it as in a part of one lineage that is that is the American white supremacist lineage. But there's multiple lineages going on at the same time with that. And I think one of them is that we have taught our society to respond with violence. We have taught our society and and we don't, you know, with certain communities or certain people, when they commit violence, we're like, they have a culture of violence, you know? That's a culture of violence. But then it's like, we don't call all the violence we see a culture of violence, which is what it, what it is. So anyways, it's complicated, and I think that's why people don't want to go for it, and it's a lot easier to just lock somebody up. Um, but that's never going to stop these things from happening. If we want to actually stop people from being killed, we are going to have to get complicated like that with it, and we're going to have to grasp things at the root. When I was younger and when I was in college and I started learning, like, I, that's when I truly started learning about prisons and reform is like as a freshman in college. And I realized about the wealth of information that has been hidden from the public about prisons and that if you can hide information, you can maintain this, I, this, this standard of punishment and that there is no like prompt for, for, the government to give the public information about what is going on in prisons, health care in prisons, uh, health standards in prison. When I was writing my book that like there were women being sterilized in prison up until like after 2014, I believe. And I was just like, wow, because these people are considered criminal right? We don't have to know about the crimes against them. And then there's this interesting thing about like prison being the punishment and then being punished while in prison. And the idea that your, your quality of life can be reduced because you are on punishment. And then it becomes this question of like living in America, prison should be abolished, right? But like, what is the quality of life that an American, right, or even someone just on this land w is deserving of? And is that even a, I know that's a loaded question that we might not be able to answer, but I'm very interested in like, one, why we don't talk about the quality of life in people of people in prison, and two, how do we defend a quality of life for people in prison? The first thing that it makes me think of is that it's not only that the information is hidden, it's that the prisons are hidden, you know? Like the prisons as buildings, they're not in the city. I've been to some prisons in Arizona, some detention centers run by private companies. They are out of the way. You have to drive hours to get to them. You know, I've been to, to uh, prisons in New York, you know, run by, by public prisons run by the state. They're still out the way, you know? You gotta move to get to them. And there's a reason for that is that they don't want you to think about it on a daily basis. They want to remove people from society and they want to remove them from your view so that you don't think about them, you're not worried about what's happening and you can keep living your life and not think about it. And the only people that have to think about it are the people in the situation or the family members of the people in the situation, right? And that's how they got it set up. And so that's really important what is made visible and what is not. And I have a lot of different thoughts about that <laughs> um, as an artist, you know, in, in different contexts. But I think in this context, I think that um, there is a very intentional reason why so many, why these places are hidden from view in all ways. Because as you said, that means that they can then basically do what they want. And that's really scary when you it's get into really what they scary. choose to do with that power. As, as a person who works in the arts, I mean, the three of us all work in the arts. Art lives in a strange liminal space for me when it comes to this particular conversation, totally, right? Totally. You know what I mean? Like, is totally. it, it are we the, are we the megaphone or are we the mallet? And I we're somewhere in the middle, right? Usually we're somewhere in the middle. And so I guess I want you, as a musician and as somebody who who believes that music is. Is, 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 is a weapon, music as a tool, right? Music as a form of resistance and rebellion and revolution and, and healing, right? Which I wanna talk about too, like all of this. Yeah. Talk to me about like why or what the connections are between music and abolition, right? Your, your passion, right? What you're, what you're, like these two elements that we're talking about, connect them for me. 
Yes, beautiful. I totally agree with you about the liminal space, by the way. That's like the best way I've heard somebody uh, describe it. And of course, it will be you. It does feel like that. Um, it feels almost, and another way I would describe it, or in its best form, is like a sort of a call and response, right? So you are receiving from, you know, everything, and then you're trying to offer up or your contribution. So that's kind of how I see it. Like, I don't, and it also is really for me also just about like, being real about, um, I never want to like feel like I have power or something. I don't know. I'm not into that. So I really just feel like another person that's trying to be a part of a community that's trying to be real about some stuff. And the first part about it is to be honest, you know, and I do think that that's, you know, one of the biggest things for, for the artists to do is to be honest, uh, in ways that are like a lot of people are afraid to be about a lot of things. So I try to be honest about my own stuff and I try to be honest about what I see and feel and experience around me as well. Um, I think as far as music's connections to, to abolition, um, I think that one of the parts to that is that, like I said, I don't think that the only barriers to achieving abolition are um physical i think there are a lot of barriers that are physical and i think in order to dismantle those things we have to get together like i said we have to organize and you know one thing that i want to say as an aside on that is that one of the biggest things we have to organize immediately about that gets often left out of the abolition conversation or just the prisons and police conversation is detention centers and ice you know immigrants undocumented people they get left out of the conversation when all the systems are connected and oftentimes folks don't, you know, rally around those folks as much as they need to, in my opinion. And those policies, which at certain points we've decried, we kind of have not, we've not continued to raise our voices as, as is needed to call for uh, the end of kids in cages, the end of separation of families, and the end of anybody being punished simply for trying to move from one place to another like come on <laughs> you know um and so those are the kind of things we need to build together but in addition to that there are also barriers of the mind barriers of the heart and those are the spaces where i think the artists can try to work inside of you know because there are like i said ideas that people have about who certain people are that are in th these different situations who is a prisoner? Who is a, a an undocumented person? Um, what is their, you know, experience like? What are they going through? What are they, you know, what kind of violences do they commit? We have all these different ideas about, and of course, informed by many different narratives that get pushed on those type of tips. And so I think where the where the music can come in is in the storytelling. And again, I I even I don't always like the word storytelling only in the context that well, I like the word, but a lot of times people assume you mean that you're making up stories or something like that. What I mean is that we're building this based on lived experience. And even when I'm making a song like one of the ones that I'm playing in this, um, you know, performance section of what they'll see today, which is a song called Holding Cell, which is like, you know, it's a story that I put in the song. It's based off of a person that I know. So it's like, this is a real story. Um, and so I think that for me, that's one way that music is important to contribute to this process of both um, rendering complex human beings who are often objectified or rendered two dimensional, even one dimensional. And also on the other side, challenging the listener to be like, what's inside that head of yours that you're not really admitting, you know, about what's inside of there? And, you know, it might not be your fault. I'm not saying you made it up. You probably got it from somewhere and you didn't even realize it's in there. But you got to realize it's in there even to, you know, shift that. So for me, that's a big part of it because there are so many um, things that are in our heads that we need to shift in order to reach the place where we can build towards abolition. The, the question has to be set up a little bit. So here's the thing. I had a buddy who was incarcerated. He, he was in there, falsely accused, et cetera, et cetera. His mother would come, you know, you got to stay hopeful. You're going to get out of here tomorrow. Stay hopeful. You get out of here next week. Stay hopeful. You get out of here next month. And then he'd say, he told his mother, Ma, in order for me to survive and do this bid, I got to lose hope. 
I got to I got to just I got to accept the fact, right, that I'm going to be in this space and I'm going to have to sort of like recalibrate. I'm going to have to recalibrate in this moment so that I can survive and so I can survive. Right. So let's let, let's let's table that. So there's that moment. My father on his deathbed um, came came alive. The la his last day of life on his deathbed in a vegetative state came alive when he heard B.B. King. Right. We turn B.B. King on, right? His, his wife is playing some, some orchestral music. I think it's the holiday time. So it's like Christmas orchestral music. Me and my older brother are like, he don't want to hear this, right? So we, turn, so we turn it to what he would have wanted to hear, which is blues and rock and roll. And like, that was his jam. B.B. King comes on, opens his eyes. He sits up. He cracks jokes with us. We laugh. We have about 30 minutes of lucid life. He says his goodbyes. We say our goodbyes. And he dies. Right now, my question is, when we talk about abolition and how you brought up the layers of abolition, not just not just physical freedom, mental and emotional freedom, the idea that there are people who have had to be forced into hopelessness in order to survive. We know that music calcifies in the brain in a different way than any other art form. It exists longer. It's used for Alzheimer's and dementia. It's used literally it calcifies in the brain in a different way. And then I think of Folsom Prison, and I know you know the history of Folsom Prison, and I know you know what they used to do there. My question to you is, are there still um, spaces for there to be live performances? Like, does Samora Penderhughes go to the island? Like, can Samora Penderhughes and his, and his band go to, to you know, to, to, to a match prison? Like, is that still no. a thing that happens? Because it, it probably would be a wonderful thing, right? But my question is, is that something that we still do? And if not, why? And if not, can you do it? Can you just go ahead and make a decision to make that happen? <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. That just, that hit me. That's that's beautiful. And um, mm -hmm. oh, so beautiful. Um, and, and also, as the first the first thing you said, also heartbreaking, but I know exactly what you mean from that, too. And and that's another thing we don't talk about. I mean, folks that corner let's talk about, you know, the spiritual, what we have to deal with spiritually in all different contexts, um, in all different uh ex lived experiences in the society just to survive and what that does to us and what it might look like spiritually for us to be somewhere else. As far as going to the question of performing in the prisons, um pre pandemic, you know, and being able to be in places and different things, there's different ways that we were considering doing that. I think that one of the things that complicates that, which is something that I think all of us as artists have to deal with is, and I, another thing I don't necessarily know that we talk about enough is that just as much as our art can be used to free people, it can also be used to justify what folks want to do to us and to other people. And gentrification is just an example as an aside, like, you know, a lot of times when folks want to gentrify a neighborhood, they'll like make a bunch of dope art stuff happen there first. And then like cats want to live there suddenly, you know, what I mean? and, and then all the services there went before it was just a neighborhood. You know what I mean? So that's one way. And, and I think another context that I, I bring that back to this question, which is just that I want to make sure that when I'm going in, it's not to uplift the prison as an institution and to say, hey, we have programs, we're doing good things, we're rehabilitating these people, you know, because that is a a myth. And it's not to say that programs are not great. Let me be clear. I think that programs are important and people receive so much from programs. So I'm not saying I'm against programs. I'm just conscious of how the programs are used in this reform context to continue to the institution, which at the end of the day is still punishing and causing more trauma than it rehabilitates. I'm not saying it doesn't do any, I'm not saying people don't receive so much from these programs. I'm saying that a lot of times they're used to justify the existence of the prison. So my perspective is the prison, the detention center, all of these spaces at base level are traumatizing places. People should not be inside of them. So that being said, if it's a context in which I can be in there and I can give something to folks and not be doing that work um or in the you know in the fred moton way be doing like the uh resistance and refusal work from the underneath then yes by all means i'm going to do that 
Um, I think that obviously one thing that is complicated, which I also would like to lift up, is that in the pandemic, obviously all live performances stopped, period. But in addition to that, the prisons were the places with the highest cases of COVID through the whole pandemic because, again, because people just don't care about, and, you know, that goes from the governor of the state to all the way to a regular person just not thinking about folks in the prison. They're just like, not thinking about the fact that these are literally people that cannot distance. They cannot distance socially. Like they're literally caged next to each other. They cannot distance. And so if any time period has taught us that something else is not only possible, but is urgently needed, it is the pandemic. Because all this, all this stuff about, oh, well, it's just a five year bid. In COVID, a five-year bid could be a could be a life sentence because you could die as a result of COVID. You know what I mean? So it's like no prison, no prisons. That's just it's got to be that way. No detention. Like there are other ways to do things. There really are, and I want people to believe in that. Um, I also think that the thing I'm most excited about when it comes to connecting music, doing music with the prisons and things, is making music with folks who are incarcerated. Because going back, you know, it's like. As writers, as musicians, as artists, they're just like dope, like just so dope, like dope. crazy dope. So for me, it's about that collaboration and building solidarity and friendship with folks that are going through those times. And they have so much to teach us and to say um, about life and about art and all these things. In addition to the fact that I also want to make it out there, like base level, they should be free. And now we uh, are fortunate enough to experience a couple of songs by Samora, accompanied by Argus Quartet and filmed by Christian Padron. Is your bill for him with the rice that 
that you can't afford They will only lift him and praise him We're still in love with the king Still in love with the king. Still in love with the king. Still in love with the king. been through more than you could imagine in 20 birthdays i want a quiet life in the flat with church on a sunday i got a voice and i got a laugh and i use it one day but now please just hear me out i am speaking through bars and writing your cards and keeping count i know god he won't leave me i'm friends with patience all amounts till that moment i'm free then i keep on waiting till they count me Hold and sell, hold and sell. 